Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. I know it's difficult on a cold Monday like this, but we appreciate you being here. My name is Emily. For those of you who are new here, I work in the Independent Living Activities Office. And just before we get started, I wanted to remind you all of a few activities that we have coming up. Tomorrow we have the Diamond Jubilee course, which is going to be super amazing. It's at 6.30 in the afternoon, and on Wednesday we have another lecture. Um, Perennial Advantage is coming in and giving a lecture on Medicare, and that's at 10 a.m. Um, and on Friday, don't forget, we also have the River Rats performance at 3.30 in the afternoon. But I'd like to go ahead and give it to Marge Hen. She will be giving a lecture on the history of Otterbein. I know I'm really excited for it. I hope everybody enjoys. Uh, well, hello everyone. Uh, I'm Marge, but today is this very special day because it's Jean Crowder's birthday. So I think we're going to sing Jean happy birthday. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Jean. Happy birthday to you. I've, no, I've known Jean for a few years, <laughs> and she also, if I'm not mistaken, knew Bob's aunt, um, Mrs. Uh, Han, uh, Miss Han, but way back in history, <laughs> way back. All right, uh, first of all, how many of you are new? How new? Within the last three or four years? Oh my goodness, okay. <clears throat> Okay, well, this is the story of Otterbein, and I believe it's unique. Uh, Bob and I have been here since uh, 2007, just a little after you came, I think. Um, and uh, I became interested in archives and history shortly after we got here, and I've been stuck in Marble Hall ever since. <laughs> but. As, I, as I've gone through the years, um, I've come to appreciate what a special place it is. Now, um, it's 111 years in the making. This particular post, you're standing in the middle, it was about 1924, and it's right in the middle of uh, 741 and 122, right there by UDF. <laughs> That's what, the, that's what the sign is. Now to begin, oops, this thing goes too fast. All right, it all began with Philip William Otterbein. That's how it got its name, but not really because it was forced on him. Um, Philip William Otterbein was, uh, uh, jo uh, Joanne Burton talked about this, he was a missionary sent from Germany to America to help the German immigrants to America over to bring them over to Christ. They, and while he was here, he met a man, he, was a, he became what we call a circuit rider. He went around and preached all over the place. And uh, when he met a man by the name of Martin Beam, B-O-E-H-M, who was a Mennonite who had been uh, <clears throat> sort of kicked out of his church, um, he, and he heard him preach, he said, you are my brother in German, mein Bruder. And he became, and he and Martin then started a new denomination that had no roots at all in Europe. So it's the first Protestant uh, church in the United States that was actually formed in the United States. And they call it the United Brethren in Christ. And the church is still there today. This is downtown, <clears throat> literally downtown Baltimore, Maryland. And it's located at the corner of Conway and Sharp Streets. And if the front door used to be right here, and his grave is right there, it's where Martin's, uh, Otterbein is buried. This is now the front door. But if you go two blocks down the street, you're at the Oreo Stadium at Camden Yards. Two blocks. And all around it is urban renewal. 
And that little old church just stands there. It's the longest running church in all of the United States. It just stands there. And they have an active congregation. And when we were there back, I think in 2012, they uh, made their money by selling peanuts and water to the people going to the ballpark. <laughs> and now they got a parking concession that's behind the church and they sell parking places. And it's beautiful inside. It's a, it's a plain church, just very plain. It doesn't have a basement. So all of the activities that go on in the church go on in a separate building. And the furnace is in the floor, and I do remember that. But the thing that always struck me was it had a, uh, an old pipe organ on the second floor, and it was purple. It's bright purple. And they said when they were refurbishing the church, they scraped all the paint off, and that was the original color. So that's where Otterbein got its name. But before that, there was um, a, uh, the church itself grew, and I felt that it grew. If you look at the locations of all the United Brethren churches, if you took 70 and went straight west, or 80, between 70 and Interstate 80. And then somewhere in, in Indiana, there's some in the south. But that's where most of the United Brethren churches were located. They didn't expand too far. Some, there was a few in the north, north of 80. But most of them were from 70 north, which is real interesting. Um, as many of you know, the Shakers owned this land. and. There was uh, Dayton in about the early 1900s became this, the center of the United Brethren Church. They had a huge publishing house here. It was located on 5th Street or 4th Street down in Dayton. And they had, uh, they had all the church publications here and all of the uh, head monkety monks were located in the Dayton area. In the late 1800s, 80s, there was a schism or a break in the church led by uh, none other than the Wright brothers' father, Bishop Wright. He was a little upset at the new constitution that the church started, and he broke away and became the old constitution. And there are still United Brethren churches around today with the old constitution. I think Alberta Hadley told me that was her background. Well, anyway, in about 1909, there was a gentleman who worked at the Otterbein Press. His name was Granville Hickson, this gentleman over here. And he happened to have a Shaker aunt that lived here, Miss Susan Liddell, Liddell. And she was a Shaker here since she was about 11 years old, so she knew all of the Shaker history, she lived it, basically, because the Shakers were here from 1805 until 1912 when Otterbein was purchased. And he suggested to his editor, uh, Dr. Philippi, uh, that he would have a really great story if he went out and interviewed his aunt about the Shakers. So. Philippi came out as assistant editor, and he made, uh, he interviewed the Shakers that were here and was treated royally, and they were publishing something called a telescope, which was like the church's journal, and he wrote the story of the Shakers, which, which is called, uh, let's see, he called it uh, just the Shakers. The editor visits the Shaker settlement in Union Village. And he said it was a place of magnificence. Well, when he came out here, he looked at 4,500 acres or so of just pristine land, a few beautiful buildings, and only 20 some Shakers. And boy, he said, boy, this would be a great place 
for a home for the aged people and the children who don't have any parents. Philippi himself was a half orphan. He called himself a half orphan because his father had passed away and his mother raised him. And he said, oh, that would, this would be beautiful. It would just, it's just perfect. But he kept that in his heart. And he then it just gnawed away at him. And he went to his boss, who was Dr. Funk. And he said, I, I would love to get my, our hands on something like that so we could found a home for the aged and the children. And Funk put that in the back of his head. Well, long about, uh, the Shakers themselves were having a heck of a time. Um, Slingerland, who had been the, quote, in charge guy, had squandered all their money. And they only had just this land left. So uh, they talked with Mr. Fennessy, who was the trustee, one of the trustees. And Fennessy was so enamored with these people, he said, I'd be glad to give you the land. And the people in the Shakers said, uh-uh, back east, no way. So after a lot of squabbling, they put it on the market. And much to uh, Mr. Fennessy's chagrin, they put it on the market to sell because they wanted the Eastern Shakers who were in charge uh, decided they wanted to get the money, bring it back, and give it back to the people who were still living there and take care of them. So Fennessy, that's how Fennessy came into the story. So they tried to sell it. Well, there were about 75 buyers or bidders. And um, one was a church. Uh, one was the state, and there were several, but they didn't seem to go anywhere. And so Funk and Philippi said, well, we'll never get it. We'll just never get it, because we don't have any money. They had absolutely none. And about that time, uh, Fantasy called and said, hey, guys, come on back. Everybody, all the people dropped out. The one that could have bought it was a, was a group from Cincinnati who, of all things, wanted to put a casino down on 63. <laughs> and the Shakers would have no part of that. So they offered the land to these two guys. Well, in the meantime, Funk and Philippi got all of the movers and shakers they could in the Dayton area that belonged to the United Brethren Church and came up with a plan on how to establish it with a constitution and the, the whole nine yards of organization and all that stuff. And on October in, in 1912, they signed a little document on a nice little marble table that we have over in, at Marble Hall and said, um, we'll buy it. No money exchanged hands, none. OK? So they said, well, we'll get back with you. We'll get back with the people in the East, the Eastern Shakers. And uh, on March the third, uh, in 1913, we will sit down and we'll uh, trans, you know, title transfer. But maybe at the title transfer, we need some money, about $50,000, because the total cost was 325,000 for 4,005 acres. That's a lot for guys that didn't have any money. So what they did is they bought actually seven farms. What the, um, the Shakers had done is to take the land, which was over here, and um, divide it into working farms that they had tenants on. That's how they kept, got their money. And so actually, Otterbein bought a farm, seven of them. And they thought, that's great, because the farms can be used 
to grow crops and help feed the kids and have the cattle and all that stuff. That will help us because there was still no money. So they went and, let's see here. The first board of trustees, this is the guys that I think is interesting. There was a bishop from the church, another bishop, the Honorable James M. Cox, who just happened to be the governor of Ohio, uh, Kogan, Reich, anybody ever heard of Reich Kumler Company? Uh -huh, he was on the board. Uh, the editor, Philippi, the agent Funk, I, I don't know who Grimes was or Cochran, but those guys were the first trustees of Otterbein on paper. So between that, between October and March, they had to raise some money. They had to raise $50,000. So what they did was they asked two returning missionaries, Dr. J.R. King and Zella King, to uh, help them raise money by going around to the, all the churches in the United Brethren and get money. Well, their story is just as fascinating. They were 1894, well he was, a graduate of Otterbein University, and they were married and immediately went to Sierra Leone, uh, Africa, as um, missionaries. And when they were over there, they had been over there for about 18 years, they had survived the uh, massacre and a few other things, but uh, they had established an orphanage and they had established churches and a school. And the kings were wonderful people. And again, I still think God had his hand somewhere in the founding of Otterbein because on their 1912 trip back from Sierra Leone to England, they had uh, seats or suites on a new ship from England called the Titanic to America. And the lady they were traveling with became seriously ill. And so they had to cancel their reservations on the Titanic and come on a later ship. You tell me if it wasn't God. <laughs> anyway, he raised all but about $20,000 by 1912 or 13. And when they had the signing, the, at the signing, the uh, Shakers from the East said, well, we'll just take a, another loan for the 20,000. So they had quite a bit. They had almost $300,000 to pay the Shakers between the 1913 and I think it was 10 years later, they wanted all the money. On land contract, this was bought. So when they got here, my goodness, kid, they started, people started arriving. They heard about it and started arriving. And the two, uh, there were two ladies. Miss Parrish was one, was the first person here, and she came right after they opened the door in April. And soon there were other people here, six kids, two families, three each. We had, uh, these are the Dickens Sheets boys, and these are the Shermer kids. Now, this picture was taken I would say May or June of um, 1913. And these are the people that lived here. And they all lived in what we call Bethany. Um, this is on the steps of Bethany. Uh, this is Dr. King, that's Mrs. King. There's the Shermer kids. And there's two of the, uh, the, the Dickens Sheets boys are over here. But this kid in the middle, right here, is Joanna Burton's uncle, right? Right, right his, her uncle. His name was uh, Mr. Howard. <laughs> and would you believe he became the president of Otterbein College? <laughs> he was here helping them, 
helping the kings because their parents were known to each other because they were all missionaries. So I just think that's kind of cool. The Dickens Sheets boys. This is Byron, Harold, and Richard. And um, Byron is the one that was here the longest. He was being the oldest and the tallest. But um, towards uh, about 1916, uh, the other boys got restless, and Harold, this one, or the end, really had a wonderful voice. He was a tenor. He, he, was, he sang all the time here. He just loved to sing. And um, he decided he would go out on his own. And he lived at the YMCA in Dayton, where he became acquainted with people, and he heard a group practicing one day, and it was the Westminster Choir people from Dayton, and he eventually became the Westminster Choir director. Isn't that amazing? He's just wonderful. The tall guy, Byron, went to Otterbein College for a little bit, had eye trouble. He was a good pianist and organist, but he, um, he just couldn't get something. He came back to Otterbein. He even worked here as a dishwasher and a cook at one time. And then later on he moved to West Virginia and he became part of a glass company and I think it's Blanco. And I don't know if that's where this group is going to visit that's going to West Virginia or not. But he became a well-known, he was the head of the church uh, uh, glass company that where that put the stained glass windows in churches. He, he really came in. Richard went back with his daddy and died in the poorhouse. That's the children. Now the children usually came in families. Oh, I just, there. They came in families, and I mean big families. Uh, three, it was small. Sometimes, I think we had one family here eventually that was 11 kids. All 11 kitties. And uh, they all worked, they all lived at first in Bethany, and that lasted for about a year till the older folks who were living there said, that's too much noise. <laughs> so they moved them across the street to this uh, building, which no longer exists, but if you go to Philippi and you look east, it was right there, <laughs> right dead right across. And um, it was an abandoned shaker building that they refurbished and they accommodated the older people. And they had rooms for two and they ate in a long thing. It, I mean, they ate well. They had cloth napkins always and tablecloths. This, this was way back in the 1900s, so that was typical. But the children kept coming. Dr. Philippi still worked at the, oh, I, I missed a big important part, why it got named out of mine. Anyway, after they bought it, went in debt, they went to the church and said, oh, by the way, we bought this in your name. <laughs> and the church said, what? And they said, after a big argument, they said, we will accept the responsibility, but it has to be named Otterbein. That's how it got its name. Anyway, Dr. Philip, he's traveling all over uh, in different cities, bringing kids in from all over, because all these kids that came, came with a recommendation from their pastor, their local pastor. And they went, that went to the executive committee who said yes or no, and so forth. And here he is bringing, I think these kids came from Iowa. Um, Marble Hall then became the re house for the remaining Shakers, but there were only about 20. But by 1920, they were almost all gone. And they came back to Otterbein. And that's an old picture of it. And this is what it looked like after the 1890 remodeling. So that gives you some idea there. It became a doctor and Mrs. King moved over there. And uh, some of the, off they used that as like the headquarters 
for Otter Bind for a while. All right, now children needed lots of things. Those children were coming in at a rate of two to one for the adults that were being admitted. And they needed an education. So the first school was this one, which was the Shaker School. That wasn't very good. So they moved over here, which was the Shaker Meeting House, and they had about three or four grades in there. At this time, the high school age kids had to go into Lebanon for school. So the very first building that Otterbein itself built was this building right here, which is still existing, still across the street. And we know it as the Warren County Services Building. And they had, they had all the grades there eventually for a few years. But as the population grew and waned and grew and waned, the kids went different places. The school was really great in sports, as long as it wasn't football. Because football takes more people. But they had great track uh, and field, they had great basketball, and they had great, um, let's see, track basketball and what's another one? Uh, softball, they had softball, because that only took nine. <laughs> okay, early transportation to the Lebanon schools was this, this bus, beautiful bus up here, <laughs> and they named it the Spirit of Otterbein. But in the 50s, of course, they be you began to see those yellow school buses, so you had all this, this going on. So that wasn't much difference. They needed a place to sleep. The early kids were all pushed together in uh, big, huge rooms. And uh, they always had these white, these white beds. And then the babies, they had little kids. They would take you only if you were potty trained. And um, the ones that weren't quite potty trained went to live with a worker here for, until they were, and then they came in as part of the children. And they put them in little boys, little girls, or nursery, little boys, little girls, intermediate, and so forth, going on all the way up. Uh, in, in 1950s, they remodeled Bethany, and that looks like a 1950s dorm, doesn't it? Yeah, they remodeled that. They also need good food. This is an early kitchen up here right here, and it was downstairs, I think, in um, uh, Bethany, down in the basement. Because a lot of the Shaker buildings had access to Shakers and fire, or fireplaces and stoves and stuff in the basement, because you didn't want to catch fire. And so they had ways to do it. This is a dining hall in that basement where they, they'd served, and they learned to serve the kids first when they were all eating together, and then the adults. But as the adults went across the way, uh, those people had their own little kitchen. They had a way to keep busy. Well, most of the older kids had a job. Uh, you had, um, and they were paid like a little allowance. Not a whole heck of a lot. The girls helped with laundry. The boys had to get up like at 5 a.m. and go out and milk cows. And one of the uh, thick and sheets boys got in trouble because he hated to milk cows. And he, his cow went dry. So he was in big trouble. The girls, the girls helped can, and the boys also helped in the laundry. Now that laundry doesn't look very safe. But they did, and the girls, thank God, did the ironing, I guess, because everything had to be ironed. They had a time for fun, and those kids really had fun. Uh, most of the pictures of the kids in the summertime, they're barefoot. They're all barefoot. They ran around barefoot, just like we did when we were little. And this is a, a car that was given to Dr. King, and he loved to take the kids for rides, not out on the road, but he'd pile them in the car and drive them around the property. And in the winter, 
They wouldn't do it today, but they pull the sleds behind the cars. We, we won't tell anybody. They thought children ought to be well-rounded, so everybody got music lessons that wanted them, and even if you didn't want them. And they had um, piano, a piano teacher. They had an orchestra. They had a full-fledged band, which they, that was the only uniforms you ever saw, was that, because the other kids didn't wear uniforms. The, in 21, the band was so good, they were invited not only to the Lebanon parade, but they went to Indianapolis and played for the church conference. And later on, they, they had a lot of musical groups, uh, choruses, choirs, and all kinds of stuff for the kids. They needed health care. This just always cracks me up. Um, 1918 was a big, big, big flu epidemic. Otterbein was not affected because we were out here by ourselves, basically. But the kids all got scarlet fever. A lot of the kids got scarlet fever. So what they did was they took an old house, uh, which is an old nurse house up, whoops, I went the wrong, I always hit the wrong button. Well, there. Um, this right here was a nurse house that was located just across from the entrance of Armco Park. And they took them all down there, and that filled up, and then they used a tent. And one of the doctors from town came out and stayed with them till they got over that. But they all got shots. As shots came along, they all got shots. And uh, it, it, was, it was amazing to me. When Philippi became a hospital, the upper floor, I don't know, Popcorn, if you were here, did you have to go up and take castor oil and cod liver oil every day? March right up those stairs, open your mouth, and Nurse Proctor just put in a, a tablespoon full of castor oil or, or a, yeah, <laughs> whatever. But they got those regularly. And when you were five, out came the tonsils. Out came the tonsils. They had spiritual needs, so they started church. At first it was in Bethany, and then it moved to Philippi, and this is the first church parsonage. I don't know if any of you were here when that little building was still over there. It was an itty bitty building. It was built in 1925, and I think it cost all of $5,000. But that was, became the home for the ministers of the church. And first minister, of course, was Dr. King because he was an ordained minister. But uh, they were supplied regularly a, a preacher from the conference. And uh, these pews right here were uh, dead. This Philippi Chapel would be located, was located on the second floor of Philippi because it's kind of a broken. But if you to get it to it today, you have to go to the second floor. And those have been now remodeled into apartments. They needed guidance, and they had a whole bunch of different matrons. Some matrons were good, better than others, but they had matrons. They did not have usually any male person to help guide the boys, but there were plenty of other men around. The old people needed health care eventually. So the next big thing that they did was they took the big north house of the Shakers, remodeled it, and made it what is known, they called the feeble house at first, but then people said, oh, that's terrible. So they changed it and called it Samaritan Hall, or Good Samaritan. And it was located again right on the curve as you come down 741. First, well, first idea was to put boys up there. And then they said, no, we don't want boys that far away from, <laughs> from somebody to keep an eye on him. They had a missionary home, which was another Shaker building, which is right where Terrace Place is today. And that was a fascinating home. Uh, they built it so that missionaries would always have a place to stay when they came to the States. 
and if they wanted their children here, they could have their children here. But unfortunately, there was only four that ever used it. And it was used more or less more often for home for the girls, where the missionary children, the widow's family. This was uh, Carol, Margaret, Harry, and em Emmer. Their dad and mother were uh, missionaries to the Philippines. They were good friends, again, of Dr. King. And they came in 1916, and they said they were concerned about World War I you know, if fighting spread that far, they'd want them back here. So they, they brought the children over. And those children stayed here the remainder till they were 18. And as soon as they were 18, you could either go out into the world or you went to college. And if you went to college, you went to Otterbein. And the, the oldest brother, Carol, went to Otterbein. He graduated. His first job was working with a man called Paul Brown over in, what's the name, Maslin, Ohio, somewhere. And he became his assistant coach. <laughs> and when Paul Brown went to the service in 1943, uh, Carol uh, had to take over the Ohio State Buckeyes. And do you know they had an undefeated season that year? <laughs> and they were belatedly named champions. Were us, you know, national champs. Anyway, he has a fascinating story. After that, he, he couldn't handle it being a Buckeye down there. So he went to OU and became their athletic director for years and years and years. OK, the girls had homes. These are the girls' homes. Um, this was the old meeting house, and they redecorated it and put a porch on it, and it became a home for the girls, uh, um, for the senior girls. And there was, hmm, I don't know, probably 17 girls in there, it could be. The smaller girls lived in a cottage called Sunbeam, and that was a building they brought up from South uh, family, uh, Shaker family, brought it up, refurbished it, and put it behind um, Bethany. They had other activities. They had Bible school, they had scouting, they had swimming pools. The kids were kept busy. They had gardens, uh, they helped mow grass, they helped with threshing, you name it, they did it. Well, an orphanage, the highest number was about 175 to 190. It, it varied because parents would put them, a parent or people would put them in and then take them out for, for within six months till they found a better house because there were no foster homes at this time. No foster homes. And uh, this is just some of the various kids. And uh, the other day, a lady came to me from Wapakoneta and she had been an orphan here in the 40s and 50s, I think. And she had a big scrapbook. And she, usually when they come to visit us over in Marble, they want us to go through their records and to get a copy of their records, which we do. And she said, uh, I want to show you something. And it was the most beautiful scrapbook I have ever seen of her time here at Otterbein. And it was a gift of her house mother. So as she left, her house mother had a gift of that for each of her girls. Isn't that something? Pictures of them and everything. It was just really cool. When they ended, um, the care ended in 1963. And if you want a story, you'll have to ask Popcorn about that. But uh, the, uh, when you were done, you got a, a gift, a discharge gift uh, paper that looked like this. And they were discharged to home or to work or to school. 
whatever. That's how they were discharged. And they were expected to make it on their own because they had been trained in a lot of the girls in homemaking skills and the boys in several different other trades that they could do around here. The other thing Otterbein did well was farming. They, we had farm all over because again, that was the source of income. The, one of the first group things we had were bees and they did stock breeding and they had a dairy business here which was right across the street and they sold a lot of milk. Their building program began, began with the school and at that time they had enough money to build Philippi. But then it stopped, they never finished it. And for, I don't know, between 21 and 35 is how many years? A long time, 14. It sat there empty until a um, pastor in Indiana felt so sorry for them, he gave them his life savings, $35,000 to finish the building. Mr. and Mrs. Kondo, Reverend and Mrs. Kondo. So that's how Kondo Court got its name. And they finished it. In the late 30s, or tw uh, 20s, like everybody else, when the stock market went pfft, why, Otterbein's went pfft also. So, uh, by the way, the Kings left in 26, and a new guy came on later on. Um, so, in desperation to keep the place open, they sold 2,000 acres to the state of Ohio for $100 an acre. And the state was supposed to make it a um, penal, penal farm where the people were farmers. But um, at Otterbein never had a decent way to get water. Their water wells would run dry and they'd build, dig another one and then their, that one would run dry and they'd dig another one. And they had trouble with pressure and so forth. So with the agreement with the state was they could build, get some wells down at that land because that's right down at the bottom of a nice deep valley which previously was on top, it's, pre, it's on an aquifer that feeds water underground. And we have, I don't know, four to six wells down there somewhere. And right now, that's the only building that's still standing down there. At least I hope it is. When Bob and I drove by uh, not too long ago, I, there was so much dirt, I couldn't even see where it's that little building. I hope it's still there. <laughs> because that's where we get a third of our water from. And uh, we, ha we own that building, the wells, and a right of way up to here. So, now before any changes, this is what Otterbein looked like if you were looking south. Let's see, this is Philippi, Bethany. Over behind it with the tall thing is marble, and you can't see the other one. This is uh, Bethany, old Bethany, and here's the school. And that's the way it looks from, looked from the air. I think this was one of Bishop Schauer's um, pictures that he had taken for Otterbein. And Otterbein kept getting started out with individual homes um, for cottages for couples and employee cottages. And between 47 and 58, that's all they built, these little cottages. And today we call them what? Um, Oh, what do we call them? Cottages. Yeah, well, they're still cottages. John, what do you call yourselves? Oh, uh, he, well, the court, the court has a different name. What's your combination of courts names? Alpha. Alpha courts, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> anyway, and some of those were peas homes and some of those were built by hand. They're all very nice, they're all Two bedroom, I think. Some have basements and some do not. Then in 45, um, 
Otter, uh, the Church of the United Brethren Church went with the Evangelical Church and formed another church called the EUBs. And the EUBs and the Otterbein had homes. So in 58, they formed a compact of homes which they would support with money from their budgets. And um, this one, Haven Hubbard right here, is, uh, was very close to where I live, grew up in Michigan. And I knew that one very well. Uh, this one is Flat Rock Children's Home. This is Friendly Acres out in um, Kansas. Cedar Falls, uh, Iowa has the Western Home and the Otterbein Home. There were five of them. And they worked together as uh, like we would do with our corporate today with the other homes. They were all together. And they are all in existence except Haven Hubbard. I forget what Haven Hubbard is now, but it's, um, it's the only one they lost. They have different respects. The school over there has had many uses. It was a school, and when they closed Good Samaritan, they moved, they changed it into a hospital for nursing care, and um, they, they uh, had, the, in the basement, they had the beauty shops. So if you needed to get your hair fixed, you had to get a ride in a station wagon across the street to get your hair fixed. In 1966, this is a big jump, uh, they had 133 residents. Uh, and it was very busy. You can see some of the little houses. This is my favorite aerial view. This shows the different areas. This is Bethany. This is Marble. This is Sunbeam. That's the other one. There, you see a swimming pool behind there? There was a swimming pool there for the kids. And this was the, a water tower before 2000. All right, now we come, and the new CEO here, or executive, or whatever you want to call him, was none other than Chuck Delgard. And they about closed in 1966. They said, should we be a, a home or shouldn't we? And I guess Chuck must have been a forerunner to, if you build it, they will come. And they started a boom. And the first thing they did was build the East Courts in 1970. And then 10 years later, they started the West Courts. The East Courts all have the names of trees. The West Courts are all birds. The Thrush Activity Center was built in 89, and it was added to and rededicated, and now that's what we call King, the King Center. The Campus Center was not in existence. They, in May 1971, they started raising money, just like they're doing now to refurbish it, and it was completed in 73, and it took a long time. But they got it done, and with the opening of it, they got a lot of stuff in one place. The bank came in about, uh, I don't know, 78, and it's now across the street, but gives you an idea. Then in the 80s, they, there was a gap between Philippi and the campus center, and they put it together. So if you go down and sit across from the, the reception desk, you're actually sitting in what we used to call the conference room. <laughs> There was a connector there in a the hall, and they also made a new dining room which a, with a big glass thing over the top. The pavilion by the lake, the lake was always was put in to collect the, the rainwater, and the, the employees from Armco Park built the, built the uh, bridge for us. And they, but they didn't get the pavilion finished till 1980. I think that's marvelous that those trees have grown. Um, the construction began for what we know as the wings, which is going that way. 
and it was they were dedicated in 75. And there's an open space right up in here, and that is this area over here, and a couple rooms that were added on later. The wings and the heritage from above. The wings were named after friends of Otterbein, old friends. All, this was Albright, which is now TCU, Newcomer, and Asbury over here. And they were all contemporaries of Philip William Otterbein. We had a multi-purpose laundry and so forth built in 63 where the gallery is today. Uh, it was maintenance laundry and so forth. And it was reconfigured later on and it looked like this. It really was cool. But shortly thereafter, they had to build, they wanted more amenities for the employees or for the residents. So they got rid of things. Again, there was a big getting rid of all the Shaker buildings in 65, but in the 60s, they tore down Bethany, which was the last really big one. And they built uh, the LEC. Now, other dates, in case you want to know. Willow Lane was opened in 83. In 85, they decided to join uh, the, uh, formed the adult Otterbein Homes and an adult daycare, and its first home was over here and back where you take physical therapy now. Matthews Hall was open, TCU was opened in 97. Matthews was added to, and in 91, uh, the first residents of the patio homes went in. Patio homes meaning um, not daybreak, but, but the Oreo, uh, Meadowlark, those, those ones. And more patio homes and Morningside were finally finished in 2005. And then Otterbein expanded through the corporate office. They opened small houses, which are small nursing areas off campus. They're small nursing homes. They house about 50 to 60 people. That's it. And that's all they do is nursing and rehab. Adult daycare moved out to King Street. Otterbein celebrated a 100th year. Life Enrichment Center opened. Hospice began. The museum reopened. Terrace Place opened. And the gallery opened and Franklin was added. This was what was replaced with the LEC. We were in that picture somewhere over there. The newest buildings on campus are the orchards, Terrace Place, and the gallery, or the LEC. And then we added changes to the front. King Drive was expanded and relocated. Campus Center was, op uh, entrance was remodeled. And then in 2018, they formed the corporation, the Union Village Development Corporation. And these two things were actually moved. This one's on Beetle Street over there, and this one is on uh, the street that you see that faces the, that's parallel to the highway. Now across the street in 2020, look what happened. Wow, a lot of things since 2020. And our side has changed too. Look what happened to the pavilion area and the three new homes on, that were added, uh, two on a Daybreak and one on Willow. And our prize is our Veterans Memorial. And the small houses added 10 more people. And the Otterbein family grew. Sunset from Toledo and Sunset Village and Kendall from Granville were added. And this is what we look like today on the map. We go straight up 75, and the only one that's off is over here. This is Franklin. But 
they put these in uh, alphabetical order, the committees, or the communities. And we are, what, 17 or 9? Somewhere up in here. Four. Four. We're four. We're down here. And um, I think that's really cool that we've grown that much. Change is constant. That's all you can say. And what was my connection? In 1956, I, 56 I think it was, I came here to sing with my college choir. And if you look close, that's me right there. <laughs> then over the years, I belonged to um, a women's club in Dayton. It was called the Otterbein Women's Club. And it was started by Otterbein alumni, and it was just for Otterbein women alumni. And every single program you could expect Jenny to Longmire to show up with a busload of Otterbein alumni from here. So I've been coming here for a long time. Even former orphans change. We just shot this at the. Uh, Otterbein picnic, or a luau. These are the two of the Gilbert boys. There were three that came. This is uh, Sam Woody and Gilbert, his brother Gilbert. They came here as little boys in 1949. Their mother had died in a tragic automobile accident, and their father couldn't take care of them. He had two sisters, and they were never raised with their sisters. But the three boys were here. And they come to every fish fry and luau we have. They come back every year. And thanks to our historians along the way who have helped document this. Uh, the first one was Donald Carper, who is a um, minister here. And he was able to write just a history as part of his thesis for seminary. <laughs> I thought that was pretty cool. And uh, OFA Ireland, O-P-H-A, was a uh, reporter for the uh, Dayton Daily, I think the journal news in Dayton. And she was actually the social editor. But she was a tremendous writer. And she wrote several books and histories. Mary Lou Warner, who took over, um, it was, um, I would call her the card lady. She was introduced to keeping track of things on three by five cards. And believe me, we have a lot of them. Like 35,000, I think. And what we're trying to always do is keep track of what, what she wrote with what actually occurred, or the item, or the object, or the person. So, and then um, Arlene Peckham, who uh, was the most wonderful person. If you, the program committee should, th a program department should thank Arlene Peckham because she is the one that founded it. She said, old people need to be busy. Yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> and she and her husband went all over the United States saying this should happen. This should happen, this should happen. And they became experts at it. Same with Chuck Delgard. Chuck Delgard wrote a couple of books just on how to operate a place like this. Because this was kind of like a groundbreaking time. And anyway, um, where'd she go? Uh, here it is. This is what Arlene wrote, Faces of the Spirit. It's the history of Otterbein that stops in 87, unfortunately. <laughs> These were written by anything that looks like that was written by Ofra. Uh, this was written by one of the uh, girls that were, was here as an orphan. And um, it's just amazing to me that um, so many people cared enough about Otterbein to write things down. And when I write for the Echoes, I get a lot of my information out of all of the various publications that Otterbein has published. And 
I have a sample of all of those. The, um, they started out because it was a, a not-for-profit, sending out a yearly, a yearly annual report. And let me tell you, these are gems. They not only gave you what went on, they gave you a copy of the finances. They were just marvelous. And they've gone on and on and on, and today we still get them, but they look like this. These listed every donor if you gave 10 cents or more. 10 cents is, look, is re recorded in there. So, let me go back really quick here. I promised Bob I'd hurry up. Does this jog your memory? Anybody remember those? <laughs> if, you, if you do, that was their early fundraiser, was the red stockings at Christmas. And if you, um, if you uh, were a kid, you filled them out, turned them in, and they started those in 1914. And I think across the street has used it once or twice as a fundraiser again, just to jog people's memory. But they raised their money that way. And I want to say also something that I didn't say before. There's been a lot of women and people that have helped. They had, always have had a women's advisory group. The auxiliary came and went. But the auxiliary that we knew it abandoned about, uh, disbanded in uh, 2018, I think. And when they left, every penny they had in their treasure came back to Otterbein in some way, shape, or form. They gave money. And in, in, oh, back in March of 22, I began a series of articles on the 11, 111th year of Otterbein. And the purpose was to acquaint new residents with each, stor with each its story. Each article re related 10 year span. I got the information by reading all the publications right down to the very last echoes. Otterbein's story is unique. It began with the dream of two men who were determined to make a difference in the lives of older persons who were unable to care for themselves and children who had no parents. It has maintained its nonprofit status since this beginning, and it's relied on monetary gifts and Christian love of others to keep it open. I'm sure neither the first board of trustees made up of the movers and shakers in the United Brethren Church, along with the officers who helped operate Otterbein Home back in 1913, nor the shakers themselves who sold the property could realize it would still be serving others today. I firmly believe that through good leadership, a vision in the beginning, and hard work and dedication of those who have worked and are working here now, the many volunteers from the community, churches, and the residents of Otterbein themselves that caught the spirit, Otterbein has grown into what we see today, nine communities, 10 small houses for skilled nursing and rehab, home health care, two hospice services, as well as other services for seniors. The passion of the founding fathers is still alive and working. Now, if you have questions, I'll be glad to answer them. If you want to look at what I brought, you're welcome to do so. Yes? I just wondered if it would be appropriate to introduce our Lynn Whitmer. Lynn is our current orphan here by himself. He, when the orphanage closed in 1963, Lynn was one of the 10 children that finished out his 18 years at uh, Flat Rock. And yeah. What happened to Otterbein College? Otterbein College is still a university, yes. It's still going about strong. It lives in, it's in Westerville. I want, I'll sing the love song for you if you want me to. <laughs> no. It's very good. Anybody else have a question? Yeah. I graduated from Lebanon High School mm -hmm. in 49. Mm -hmm. We played our 
home basketball game at a gymnasium here at Iron Mine. Yeah, there, there was a gymnasium made out of an old chicken coop, I think. They put a floor in it and they made a gymnasium. Huh? It's called a Quonset hut. Yeah, it's a big Quonset hut, yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. Marge, do you have a list of the original children that lived here? Mm hmm. Oh, okay. We have I a file on everybody, and this one goes up to 47. This is a list of all the kids that came in and where they went when they left. But before that? Yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. Thank you. This, no, this started in 1913 and went to 47. So, oh, I, I, I forgot. I got one thing else to say. Oh, I don't know where I put it. Here it is. Uh, Joanna has got a lot of connections with Otterbein, and she uh, asked uh, me if I wanted something from um, a, a, con a connection so I could copy something. The Diaries of Zella Bates King. Now, Zella Bates, when Dr. King died, they went, left here and went to Otterbein College, where they raised money again <laughs> to build the dormitory for men. And Zella was a tremendous diarist, and she kept a diary. And what I have is the 1894 diary, but I also have the 1854 diary. And just before she died in October, this is what she said. Friday, October 1st. Miss Teat here, we do cleaning. And Bob Arledge comes for a while in the p.m. to paint the roof roof over the bedroom. Do you remember that, Bob? I, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> he did. Vaguely, vaguely, I remember. Vaguely? Yeah. I think that's amazing. She, she was, she, she wrote, she didn't keep a diary he, for here. I mean, she did, but she was so busy because she became the treasure. That woman controlled the kids and became a treasure and made sure the laundry was done and all, I mean, imagine having 125 kids to be responsible for. Yeah, Bob. Yeah, I, uh, some of you probably don't know, but uh, Virginia Longmire, her maiden name was Philippi. Yeah. And uh, we were classmates at Otterbein University from 51 to 55. But I wanted to know if Jenny uh, Philippi's, was that her uh, family that this Philippi Hall was named after? It's a it's a offshoot, isn't it, Jeannie? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, there were two, there were uh, Philippi. Great grandfather is a cousin to the founder. Yeah, he's a cousin. Her great grandfather is a cousin to the founder. It, the tree, and we, I actually met. Uh, John Ruskin, or was it Rus John something, John Martin uh, Philippi the third, who is a, uh, probably right now he's in uh, college, is a cute kid from Centerville. <laughs> All right, I couldn't remember, the, I couldn't hear the name of the person you said I painted her ceiling for. Who was that? Mrs. King, when she lived in, at, um, at Otterbein in Westerville. Okay, I remember that. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> so if you're welcome to come up and look at anything. Anybody else? Yes. I, I didn't give a chance to give all of the activities because there were so many. It would take me three hours. Okay, uh, just the other day I was asking my husband if we still had a copy of Arlene's book. The Faces of Otterbein. Do you have some extras up there that I could buy one from you for my son for Christmas? <clears throat> I don't have any extras to sell. Oh, okay. Well, that answers I'm that. I'm sorry. Uh, we, we promised that we would keep, we have, we have 10 and we promised we would keep those in a box. That's all we have. Anybody else? Yes. Here she comes. Oh. You mentioned, you mentioned Maslin and uh, Paul Brown. Yeah. That's where I was born and raised. What was the connection to Otterbein? Uh, the Carroll boy was a, was a football coach there with Paul Brown. I mean, if you come from Maslin, that's all you know about is football, right? Thank you. <laughs> that's how it was. 
he was he was a uh, he was a coach he was a coach there. Yeah. Any others? Come up and look. <laughs> 